Good. Thank you, Brianna. Thank you so much for having. Whoa. Thank you so much for having me. For having me here today. Well, it's uh, sometimes these microphones. All right. So thank you so much for having me here today. Hopefully you can hear me all right. Um, I uh, thank you also to Nicole, to Rick, uh, Nick, and Ed for setting things up. It's been such a great, uh, you know, it's been such a great setup here at WVU. And I also want to thank you just for having PR as part of the presentation during this session, because so often when you're putting together, so often when you're putting together integrated marketing, PR winds up off in the silo and kind of a forgotten part of the mix, which is, um, uh, I guess, uh, okay, thank you. So, so often PR winds up in a silo, kind of like an off, in a, in, not in the core part of the mix. And um, going into this presentation, I, I, I was spending time thinking about that. Why is PR kind of off to the side so often and thought of as, in many ways, a second tier discipline behind advertising and marketing and, and other parts of the strategic process? And I think part of it is that, um, I think part of it is that people don't understand what PR people do. So, well, I'm sorry guys, I'm having some serious technical difficulty today. So the question, what do PR people do? And I think that part of the reason for that is bad behavior by PR people, and also the inability or perceived inability to measure. So I'm sure at different times if you've worked with PR, it sometimes feels like PR people are taking credit for all the good things in the news, and you're not really sure if they played a role in it. And uh, when it comes to the bad things, they say, oh, we don't have that much control. And I think that, that part of the uh, sound, does that resonate? So I think that um, part of that is bad behavior. And part of that also is that earlier, at different times, they're, they're, uh, the industry had been more difficult to measure. Sometimes there were instances where there had been a ton of work behind the scenes, and you may not just not have felt it. Also, part of the reason why is that, hmm. I think also part of the reason why is that per, uh, cultural perceptions of PR. So you look at when PR really started to become very visible in pop culture. And people have said the word PR for a while, but in the late 90s, PR became so much more visible. And there was a cover issue of New York Magazine in 1998, which had Lizzie Grubman, before Conscience Point, Harriet Weintraub, a lot of the people who became uh, big figures in PR, and there became this image of these PR party girls, schmoozers. And then also there was the smooth talker, like the character who um, Aaron Eckhart portrayed in Thank You for Smoking. And then a couple years earlier, there's the spin doctor idea, of, or the malevolent, malevolent spin doctor, like Robert De Niro's character in Wag the Dog. So there's this perception and kind of this poor PR for PR, ironically. So, the, I, so the, uh, a lot of the confusion, a lot of the, the placing PR as a second tier discipline it's, it came from those areas of the inability to measure and a lot of the cultural perceptions and business perceptions of PR and what it was and whether or not it brought value. So also, when people tend to think about PR uh, from a marketing standpoint, there's very much a view of media relations, which is really a subset of PR. And it's the idea of procuring earned media for your brand. So, as the you know, as more of a practical application, as a PR person, you're thinking that you look at different ways that people consume the news. Whether it's newspapers, which of course there's so much less of that, blogs, radio, TV, um, and there's a finite amount of editorial space. Even today, where there's so much content out there, as far as reporters and journalists putting out the news, there's only so many people you could go to, and so many brands looking for a little bit of exposure. And before, um, Joe spoke a little bit about the 80-20 rule and how 20% of the influencers drive 80% of the news. And with PR, you look at outlets like the New York Times or the AP, and even in today's um, social media driven or social media landscape, you get one of those lead steer placements for your brand or your organization, and it has this effect where it spreads it out across the whole social media ecosystem. So looking at all the, you know, and I think that if you're familiar with PR, a lot of this is just things that, that you know. But when I think about my early days in, when I first worked in the industry, a lot of things that I thought just kind of happened, I didn't realize all the work that went on behind the scenes. So if you look at um, just today, I was looking at the news this morning. We all get, if you stay at the Hilton Garden Inn, you got USA Today. And, you know, article on, on the new MSC cruise ship. Why was this covered today? 
why in the Daily Athenium, which is the newspaper for West Virginia, how come there's articles on Alice in Chains by a reporter for the newspaper? How come there's one for Rob Zombie, which is actually an AP story that got picked up? And the reason why is because you have, odds are, odds are you have a PR person who is working with that reporter, lobbying for their story to be told right now. Whether it's summer season, people are looking to book trips and of course, you know, have that cruise story run now, or whether it's targeting college students for an album. So we're all marketers, you know, we, we understand that, we get that. But a lot of times, I like saying that because sometimes it's taken for granted that there's so much work and so much happening behind the scenes to place those stories. And I think about one of the first experiences I had with PR. At the time, I was studying broadcast at Syracuse, and I got an internship at Channel 2 News. And I was so excited for it. It was Channel 2 in New York, and I was working on the news desk. So I sat at the news desk, and the first thing that happened was my phone rang, and it was someone on the phone busy immediately blabbering to me about some product or another that we needed to cover. I'm a 19-year-old kid with zero power, zero authority. I listened to the guy talk for about five minutes, write down what he had to say, eventually gave it to an editor, got thrown in the garbage, and that was the end of it. Later, when I took my first job in PR, and I, I didn't, I mean, honestly, I didn't even realize exactly what the job was. It just looked fun, it looked creative. At the time I was, I was doing radio in Syracuse, I came home and it was the dot-com era. So it wasn't hard to get a job in PR. So I figured I'll do this for a little while, see what happens. So one of the first things that happened at that job is I sit down, I get a long list of people to call. And I have a client who I was representing. And the idea is you need to get them to write stories on your client. And then all of a sudden it hit me, I'm that guy. I'm thinking, oh my god, like, I don't know if I want to do this for a living. And you know, ironically, 14 years later, I'm, the, you know, in PRS, uh, I'm speaking for all of you. So, at the, uh, so what I quickly realized working in the profession is what happened on the other side of the desk. Part of it was being able to concisely and effectively communicate the story that you were looking to tell, and also getting to the people who were the decision makers. And what I also quickly learned working in the field is that it takes a lot of time and effort to do that, and that there's a certain art and a craftsmanship to being able to sell your story. And part of that is understanding the media's perspective. So bear with me, because it's already well established that technical stuff isn't my strong suit. So. Um, so there we go, wow. Okay, so as far as media relations goes, one of the biggest benefits to being able to understand how to do media, and you don't have to be a PR person to appreciate this. In fact, I think it really benefits marketers because when you're looking holistically at your strategy, having this understanding will make you so much better at understanding how to manage your PR teams. You need to think about the media who they are pitching to. And at the end of the day, as much as we talk about the press as the fourth estate and how they're looking to cover the news and, and um, how, it's, how it's the watchdog on all things, it's a business. It's about selling newspapers. It's about driving eyeballs. It's about tune in. So ultimately, they're looking for news stories that are new, that are, or that are timely, that are relevant, breaking the scoop. That's something that ultimately will help them accomplish their business objective. So we talk about a lot of the different brands and brand love, and, and there were so many great presentations today. The trick is how do you take a lot of those brand messages and weave them effectively into PR? And part of it is that you have to think about what makes your story newsworthy. Something that I frequently talk about with brands is the why now factor. You know, brands say we have such a great story. We were founded in, by this family that has, owned the, that has owned the company since the 1820s, and we've got great values, and we're environmentally friendly, and so on and so forth. But what I say is, why now? Why cover that story today versus a week from now versus a year from now? And part of that comes down to understanding what is news, whether it's a product that you're launching, like Coke Freestyle, game-changing product. So getting the news around that is, is it gives you something real meaty to work with from a PR standpoint, but it's not easy because then you have to, one, leverage that to your advantage to get in the press, and then once you accomplish that, be able to communicate messages that align with the branding while still giving the press something that they can report on and that they feel gives value to their audiences. And then you have products where it's less well known, and there's pros and cons. With Coca-Cola, for example, people have preconceived perceptions. You look at another story that was in USA Today about Vodafone headphones. They were in the news today because they launched a new headphone, 
part of the newsworthiness of the brand, and it was a headphone where you can share out the music that you're listening to as you're listening to it. Really cool stuff. So at the same time, I bet that story was tough to place because once you got in front of the reporter, it's a cool story and it's relevant, but they have no understanding of the brand and why write about Vodafone when they have all these other brands that people are familiar with. So those are some of the challenges that PR people are facing every day. And when you're looking to craft a brand marketing strategy and you're thinking about how to manage the PR people to tell that story, or if you're a PR person working with the brand team, you have to be able to uh, bring up that divide of brand versus providing messages to journalists and figuring out how to bridge that divide. So, as far, let me get involved. As far as, uh, as far as the meet, measuring the value of PR. So another reason why PR sometimes has, has admittedly uh, its detractors is because you'll sometimes see things uh, measured and, and you raise an eyebrow. Really, did 20 million people really read that blog post? Was that article worth $5 million? And sometimes, if it's the right outlet, a lot of people you did reach. And it may not be that they actually read the article. It ju could just be more of a reach thing. But other times, there's, there's different ways to be looking at PR. And of course, the big difference, as we all know, between advertising and PRs, if you have a great ad campaign, you feel that lift. With PR, sometimes you will. But it's more of an equity play and a long-term equity play. As far as what are the big home run PR hits, if you were to ask me a few years ago, what's the home run PR hit? It's Oprah, Today Show, USA Today. You had a big hit in Oprah, you knew you were moving product. And not only were you moving product, you were establishing cultural relevancy for the brand that you worked with. But something that I think um, Jason said, or no, maybe even Scott said before, is that you look at how the media has become so increasingly segmented decade by decade, year after year. And with the exception of the Super Bowl, arguably American Idol, it's very hard to reach the masses. So now you ask me, what is the biggest hit? What's the best placement I can get for a brand or an organization that I work with? It's Google. I mean, you think about how people are making purchasing decisions, whether it's buying a car, buying life insurance, choosing what school to go to, deciding their opinion on a political issue. They're making their decisions going to Google. So a lot of the work that I'm doing, it's not just that person who that day, at that time, saw Oprah talking about something. It's them, it's that, it's that lasting story that lives forever, which is a little bit scary, on search engines or on Twitter or on Facebook. And that's part of what we're doing now, is we're telling a brand story and having it live effectively via SEO. And then also something that I think is so vital for marketers, and it, it always amazes me how many people don't do this, is when you get a great PR placement, in addition to that, having it live online, use that as a marketing tool for your sales force. I think that sometimes what you'll see is, I mean, some of the, one brand that I know just because I work with them and they do it so well is Hillshire Brands, which used to be Sara Lee. What they do is they, every time their sales team is going out on a pitch, they give them these great kits that show all the news that's happening. And even before, they're gonna have a big, booth at Bloghurst, there's going to be thousands of bloggers talking about this new product that's launching. We were just on The View. We're slated to do a PR challenge on the Today Show. Being able to do that, it excites your sales force. It gives them something added to have in their arsenal. And it really takes the value of a PR placement and extends it beyond the people who just happen to cross, who come across it or who see it the first time it runs or later on. So those are just some things to think about. And, and you may already be doing it. And, and forgive me if um, it's something that, that you know this stuff. But a lot of people don't. So I like, bringing, I like bringing it up. I like reinforcing that. And I think part of what happens isn't just understanding that, of course, that's what you should be doing. It's making sure that there's communication. Because as I said at the onset of this presentation, all too often you have PR over here, and you have the sales force over here, and the ad force over here. And they're not always communicating. So having the sales team be aware of all the good work that's being done, that's you know bridging that divide. So I spoke about uh, media relations as a subset, but the reality is that PR is much more complex. And uh, you know I, I can't uh, we can spend the whole time talking about all the different facets of PR. So I'm going to go through this relatively quickly. But you have consumer marketing, which of course is leveraging PR to get the story in media that directly reaches the consumer, and that is a lot of what we're talking about: aligning PR with a marketing effort. There's also corporate communication. So part of that is telling your brand story. So whether it's investor relations story that will help elevate or communicate and build shareholder value, 
whether it's getting great profile pieces in in you know Wall Street Journal, um, uh, different uh, you know Motley Fool, you choose it, um, that you name it, that basically helps people build confidence in the brand, build confidence in leadership. That's another type of PR that reaches a different audience, more the business community, you know, potentially the investment community. Executive branding. You think of the CEOs who do it really well, where you feel like you know them, you know that brand. Tony Shea from Zappos is a great one. Um, Yvonne Cunard from Patagonia is one who's, who now you don't see as much of him, but he was really good at it. Um, uh, Tom's, uh, Mikulowski, he's fantastic. But people who you know their values, you know what they stand for, you know what the organization stands for. Building a platform for the business leader, because there's many, many studies that show that, show that the CEO or found, and founder, CEO and or founder of an organization, both have a lot of impact on creating a halo that extends beyond the brand. So being able to effectively tell their story. Because like it or not, especially in this media environment, where information travels so fast, they are the unwilling ambassadors of the organization. So looking also at CSR, corporate social responsibility. I mean, we can all talk about how important it is to have good policies and have good procedures. And, and now, a lot of that is being scrutinized so closely. Around 2008, there was this huge push for brands to go green. And then the backlash was greenwashing because a lot of hype was out there and the press called them on it. So many different companies became cautionary tales. So, but it goes beyond just being green. It's about really, as a corporate citizen now, people expect companies to give back to the communities where they do business. So looking at CSR, approaching it in a real strategic manner and within the context of a larger brand strategy. Um, public affairs, thinking about the government issues that affect your business. Even if you work primarily in consumer marketing, you know, I mean, there's a million examples you could think of. If, you know, your smartphone, talking while driving, texting while driving, the political issues that affect that. For, you know, I wouldn't have to tell anyone who works in healthcare or pharma about being aware of the different issues that affect your brand. And we actually do a lot of work with the bowling industry. They have, a, they have to think about issues such as, uh, you know, now people don't smoke in bowling centers anymore. But that was something that was a hot issue. Um, looking at social media, of course, which we're spending so much time thinking about. And what I'm going to spend more time talking about today is social media and social media being managed by both PR as well as the other disciplines. And how, you know, we, you know, I think just it's, it's important to call it out that there is, in many organizations, a turf war going on between PR and advertising and even HR and CRM as far as who owns, P, who owns social media. And the reality is that social media is something where everyone should have a, some, a stake and everyone should have some skin in the game. Um, and, you know, we'll spend a lot more time talking about that in a few minutes. Cause marketing, which is different than CSR. Cause marketing really falls, you could say, within CSR, but that's taking a cause making it a part of really closely aligning your brand with it. And so an example that you could, that's very high profile is Yoplait and the pink lids. People associate Yoplait with breast cancer now, and it's really helped elevate the brand and give them differentiation against Dan and other, other competitors. So those are some of the many different types of PR. And you have some companies that do all of it and others in varying degrees. And consumer marketing, I think, and social media is what we're probably going to spend the most time talking about just because it's the most relevant to a lot of the conversations. Now, we spoke about measurement and how, particularly in the past, it seemed so nebulous what, P, what the results were of PR and measuring PR. One of the great byproducts of, the social, of social media is it's become so much more, uh, you can be so much more transparent and it's been so much easier to measure uh, or, or there's so much more ability to measure PR. And this is just a snapshot of all different types of measurement principles. Um, I recommend, if you're not familiar with it, Googling the Barcelona principles. I mean, not, not the most effective branding, because the principles were developed in the city of Barcelona, but it's all different measurement principles that were put together by a global alliance. And, and it's specifically about measuring PR. So s certain things to think about is not just impressions and reach, message pull through in the stories that are being generated are the key messages being delivered. So it's one thing to get, you know, I think that, um, that uh, one of our clients is Zumba, and I'm going to talk a little bit about this. It's one thing to get Zumba in the news. It's another thing to get the right story told. I'm sure that for Cafe Press, that's a challenge that's being told. For Coke, I have no doubt that that's a challenge. So part of its message pull through, tonality. There's, you know, there's an old adage, all PR, all press is good press. Ask Tiger Woods that, see if he agrees with that. I think that tonality, making sure that you have good press, that's, that's essential. 
and of course, and then many, many different subsets. But you know, speaking about measurement, speaking about all these different applications of PR, when do people really think about PR? When do people really start thinking like, man, I have to really get my PR strategy together? When things blow up, that's when people think about PR. And Joe spoke about that before, that you know, having a crisis plan in order. And of course, yeah, I just showed uh, Deepwater Horizon and BP. But now, if in this environment where social media has sped things up, and we used to talk about the 24-hour news cycle, now in seconds, the reputations of once venerable brands can be tarnished by something going out lightning fast via Twitter or via Facebook or you know, pick a social media channel. And you look at brands like Toyota that were, you know, had these pristine images. And regardless of where your political leanings are, Fox had a better image until a lot of the issues that they had gone through. But I think that right now, most of us would, would agree that where there's so many possibilities with social media, it opens so many doors. From a reputational standpoint, there's incredibly high risk. So I think what Joe spoke a lot about yesterday that I very much agree with is having a crisis plan in order, beginning to think about a lot of the issues that you could potentially deal with. Because the reality of the situation is in the current media environment where decisions need to be made very quickly and where sometimes you have people, you could have you know, a, a, a relatively young practitioner who's manning your Twitter feed or who's manning your Facebook posts. Errors will happen and mistakes will happen. So being able, to the best of your ability, to react nimbly. And then as Scott had said before, which I thought was really good, admitting when you make mistakes and taking accountability. I think that's a, a theme that Jason added on too. So looking at PR and business strategy, something that um, we're starting to see. And I think that, to its credit, I think IMC and WVU were a couple of years ahead of its time in building PR into this course and really offering an, an integrated marketing course. Now what we're starting to see is as far, and this is very um, comforting for people who work in the PR industry, is you're starting to see a trend of PR being offered in, in MBA courses and as part of higher education. And uh, you, we did a study in 2010 for PRSA, which um, if you're not familiar, it's, it's uh, the Public Relations Society of America, it's the largest member organization for the industry that, that I'm that I'm, uh, you know, that of course I'm here representing, we learned that in 80% of MBA programs, PR had no presence. So when you have future CEOs, CMOs, brand managers forming their fundamental viewpoints on business strategy, they're not even thinking about PR. It's not on their radar. So something that we that we launched two years ago with um, five business schools, uh, talk at Dartmouth, Kellogg at Northwestern, um, UTEP, which is the number one Hispanic MBA program, uh, Quinnipiac, and, um, and uh, also uh, uh, Maryland University. We intentionally chose five schools of all different sizes, all different geographies, and they, and they announced that they were making PR a regular part of the, and strategic communications a regular part of their MBA programs. And we also had statistics that we, that we um, found working with Kelton, uh, which is a research company, that there was this appetite among employers, among students, and within academia for, to provide business students with a more well-rounded understanding of the soft skills when it came to communications. Because so much was taught about supply chain and operations. But right now, especially, everything we spoke about, about this, this environment where news travels so fast and where you are increasingly becoming, whether you're the CEO and in many cases the brand manager, the voice of your company, being able to, being able to at least understand strategic communications and PR, the way it works, that's a trend that, um, that we're moving in. So the organization that I represent, PRSA, and I'll, I'll talk about this relatively quickly, but I think it's very pertinent because it, um, it's, it gives at least some perspective on what's happening in the industry and whether or not you work in PR. If you work in other aspects of marketing, some of the big issues that are happening with us is PRSA, our mission for a very long, our vision and mission for a very long time revolved around helping PR have a seat at the table. And when business strategy was being decided, not being off in a silo, but being up there with advertising, marketing, and, 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 uh, and other disciplines and being in the room speaking about how we could contribute and the PR implications. And at the time, a lot of what our 
a lot of what our professional development offerings centered around were m less focused on other disciplines and more focused on being a really good practitioner, thinking like a journalist, being a great writer, being able to do PR events that mattered. And we still offer a lot of those coursework, but part of how we've changed is now as we're starting to become more and more an inter and a, a part of integrated business strategy, we're educating our practitioners not how to think like a journalist. That's a given. If you work in PR, you better know how to do that. But you have to be able to think like a CMO, be able to think like a CEO, be able to think like a CMO, and be able to really bridge the, ga the gap between what journalists are looking for and what business leaders are looking for. So a lot of what we've been doing to plus up the, um, the professional development offerings is, uh, is focusing on corporate acumen, business acumen, corporate strategy. Even if you don't have to understand the nuances of advertising, understanding fundamentally how advertising works, how media buying works. And in the same breath, I think that in order to manage our discipline well, it's understanding how PR works. So I think that that's, that's part of where, where, where we're headed as a profession and as a member organization. So you know, going back about the ethical quandary that a lot of PR people face, this, um, this very poor PR and image for PR, what's uh, part of what we also do, part of our mission, is to advocate for ethics in the profession. And it's interesting, because so often you hear people say, be ethical, have good values, be honest, be transparent. A lot of the ethical dilemmas, a lot of the missteps that are made are snap decisions, and then someone's trying to cover them up. You know, the cover-up is always worse than the, uh, the initial crisis. There's so much truth in that. And part of, and also, of course, there's sometimes just poor judgment. But with uh, part of being a mature discipline, as PR continues to become integrated into marketing and measured much more effectively, is, is looking at, one, the business results of what we do, but also being transparent when ethically, and by that I mean not just ethically the messages we're putting out, but ethically how we speak to other marketers. Admitting when a PR campaign isn't working. And because if we're going to be judged and held at to the same standard of advertising, where you have an ad, you know right away if it's not working. Or a direct mail campaign, you know right away whether the register's not ringing, you know, there aren't beds in, heads in beds if you're in a hotel, or there aren't butts in seats if you're in restaurants. Being able to admit we're getting less traction in social media, the engagement isn't as high, people aren't talking as much. There's that part of ethics. And then there's the other part, which is when something happens publicly, admitting that you made a mistake, and when you're in that position where before the mistake's been made, thinking beforehand, having a plan beforehand, so that at the very least you're as prepared as possible to make the right decision. So those are some of the different areas of ethics. Other areas that we just focus on in organization is I talk, spoke a bit about professional development, about education within our industry, about diversity. Those are all some of the table stakes of what a member organization should do and what we do. So now speaking about the industry, speaking about PR, right now the lines are, are blurring so much between the disciplines. And this goes back to the turf war that I alluded to before. Social media, there's, there's there's all these, you have advertising saying that there's such an important, because of the nature of it, there is a lot of one-way communication that's pushed out and have an honoring brand and honoring creativity. In PR, there's so much talk within our industry about how social media is really, it's, it's not one-way messaging. It's a two-way dialogue. So of course, PR people, where part of our nature and part of our job is interacting with different audiences and interacting with different mediums, it's essential that we're a part of this. And then there's HR and customer service and CRM. The reality is that for social media, I think the best strategy is an integrated one. And part of best practices for that is, is one, looking at social media, not platform by platform. We're going to focus on Twitter, or we're going to focus on Facebook or advertising is going to own Facebook, <coughs> PR is going to own Twitter. It's looking holistically at the social media ecosystem and understanding that information that's on Facebook will be shared with information that's on Pinterest or Twitter or MySpace. Or it's, everything is interconnected, which I think we get in this room, but sometimes we take it for granted and we wind up segmenting ourselves. So understanding, one, looking at social media as an ecosystem, and then two, setting clearly defined roles. This is what PR will do. This is what advertising will do. This is what CRM will do. This is what HR will do. This is the role of legal. This is how you all should work together. 
And a lot of that falls on the lead marketers working hand in hand with a lot, with um, sometimes it could be the lead legal counsel, depends on the organization. But setting those clear parameters, that's what helps avoid some of the turf wars. And ultimately, it could lead to great work if you have people working collaboratively together. Um, paid, earned, shared, and owned. So I think, um, to just spend a, a moment on that, I think that, I think that um, we've already spent a lot of time during this conference speaking about the differences between paid, earned, shared, and owned. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna hit that point too hard, but I think it's important to know that with PR being a earned, primarily an earned media driver, that said, right now more than ever, there's integration with other channels. Because where, you know, the, the example that Jason said before, that you put a post on, on Facebook, you're probably reaching about 16% if it's a great post. You're probably reaching about 16% of, of uh, people who have, have you in their newsfeed, or you're penetrating 16% of news feeds. That's, that's um, part of how you amp up that PR message is putting some, <coughs> some uh, paid spend against it for that particular medium. And that's something that, in general, when it comes to putting content out there, whether it's earned content or whether it's paid content, making sure people notice it and it's not a tree falling in the woods. It's looking for opportunities to find the convergence between paid, earned, and owned. So, Thinking 360, looking at PR's role in context, and delivering added value at all times. If you want to think about organizations that really do it well when it comes to integrating PR and different disciplines, I think of the movie industry. I think about when the, the, you know, we're gonna have the Hunger Games coming out in a bit. You're gonna see billboards everywhere. It's gonna be all over Facebook in people's feeds. You're gonna see Jennifer Lawrence on TV, on magazine covers, on Access Hollywood. Um, you're going to be getting things in direct mail. When you take your kids to your restaurant, you're going to have you know, uh, Happy Meals or whatever, whatever toys for Hunger Games. So Hollywood does it well a lot of the time when it comes to integrated marketing. So at the same time, when you're thinking about brand strategy, you may not have the same resources of a major motion picture studio, but being able to integrate and look at delivering added value across all channels, that's where you really put your PR dollars to work. And part of that is, when you're putting together plans, having a unified team approach, early on, instead of going to your PR team and saying, here's the marketing plan, come up with some good ideas and activate against it, having, bringing them in a little bit earlier, thinking about how can we do this so it really sings with PR. And if you outsource a lot of work to agencies, having your agencies work together. I, I love it when a part of a team where the, where the organization or the client says, all right, we're gonna set collective goals for you and you're all gonna be judged by these goals, and we're not gonna supervise you. We're gonna set some guidelines and you have to work together to put together a plan. It creates so much camaraderie between the agencies. And it's not just external, also internal with an organization. If you're, if you're a leader or a manager, having the different department heads work together and forcing them to have collective goals so that they, so that they have to work in an integrated fashion. That's when you tend to see the really great work. Granted, easier said than done. But that's what we should try to aspire to. And I think the best work that, that I feel like I've done as a professional, the best work that I've seen as an industry, is where you have it and is where you have that level of, of integration. And um, when it comes specifically to ad buys, if you look at some of the very effective campaigns, and a lot of these are on American Idol, it's, uh, and, and shows like that, where you have the product placement in the show, you have the ads running during the breaks, you have stories that are winding up in the press about how people are, whether it's a, big, a good one was Cybex and Biggest Loser, how people were using Cybex equipment to get in shape, and then you would see the brand on the show, and then you would see the ads. Being able to, to plan way ahead and have all the different levers working in tandem, that's where you really start to see campaigns working. Because if you look at PR and try to measure the results of a single PR placement, you're not gonna see the same impact if it's part of a larger, you know, larger uh, program. So, going to the one team approach, you know, spoke a little bit about that. Measuring fearlessly. And this is something that I always, I think that if you work in advertising or marketing, you, you probably, hopefully you do a lot of this, I always include this when I'm speaking to PR practitioners because there tends to be an apprehension to admitting when things aren't going well. And I think if you're managing PR people, you have to let them know it's okay, not everything's going to work. Because for, I think that going back probably 10 years ago, being in integrated meetings, sit around the table and you have the ad agency go up and they'd say, this campaign was working, we didn't have as much of a lift here, here's why not, here's what we're gonna tweak. 
then go to the media buying. During this day part, we're seeing a better reaction. We're not seeing as good a one here, so we're going to heavy up here. You get to the PR people, they're like, hey, we're in the New York Times, and they move on. So I think that part of the issue is that is institutionally how a lot of practitioners reported, uh, reported the results of their work. And now, with social media, where it's so much more measurable in real time, and where there's so much more integration, as a, for the PR practitioners in the room, you have to acknowledge when something's not working. You have to admit failure, but never accept it. And for marketers, challenge your PR people, because they can measure. There's many different ways. There's very, there's, especially when it comes to social and digital, there's lots of different mechanisms. Lots of, it, may, it may take a little bit of a spend to, to do different uh, measurement tools, but there's lots of ways to measure the efficacy of work. So those, that's something that I think is important to the continued maturity of the, of the PR discipline and to working effectively. Uh, this is something that I think I would expect all of us here to do, but I always like to, um, to point it out because when it comes to PR, for some reason, there's, there's uh, and, I, and I say this when I'm talking to people who are PR practitioners the most, is that if you're really going to think like a marketer, if you're really going to think like a CEO, you have to embrace the analytics. You have to embrace math, because that's how they're making decisions. And sometimes it makes me cringe when I hear it, that it's like the chalk on our like fingernails on a blackboard. When I hear PR people say, I went into this because I hate math. I'm horrible at math. It's the worst thing that you could possibly say. You automatically lose credibility. So I think that, and if you're managing PR people and you hear them say that, I'd call them on it. Because that's, that's uh, ultimately, during this time where everything is measurable, where you should be thinking like business, challenge them to be focused on the math, to be focused on the data. And also, when it comes to social, I spoke about social as an ecosystem. And making those tough decisions, you know, well, of course, everything's interconnected. Do we invest a little bit more on Facebook? Do we invest a little bit more in Pinterest? Do we invest a little bit more in Twitter? At times, you're going to have to make big bets, but back those bets with research. And that's something that, is, as marketers, you know, comes second nature. PR practitioners, make sure they're doing that. And, and if you are in PR, you need to be thinking that way. So when it comes to making those bets, and when it comes to dipping your toe in the pond with social media, I think that a great case study that now is granted an old case study, but I like bringing it up because I think it's something that still holds so much truth, is when Office Max did the Elf Yourself campaign years ago. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the history. They did Elf Yourself uh, campaign. Basically, it's, you know, you put a picture of an elf and everyone dances around it. It wound up being spread all over. It was a campaign that truly went viral. What they did is they launched 20 campaigns at once. And that was the one that garnered the most engagement. So they cut the other 19 and heavied up. So part of it is thinking you know, about bullets versus cannonballs. And you look at some of the big, uh, especially in CPG, the big CPG campaigns, spend a year planning, a year, uh, a year researching, a year planning, and then a year before the campaign hits. I mean, think about how different the environment was two and a half, three years ago versus the way it is now. It's perilous to approach that way. So you need to be able to move a little bit faster, be able to move a little bit more nimbly. So I think I'm uh, starting to run low on time. I'm going to give a quick case study for Zumba. I think that actually I'll give really two quick case studies. For Zumba Fitness, Zumba is an interesting brand because this is one where you, um, they're, very well, they're very well known in that they, uh, they're very well known in that they uh, have cultural relevance. The people know it as a group exercise class that is you know, a popular Latin dance workout. But what people don't know is that Zumba is, is really a global multimedia brand. There's a company behind it that licenses Zumba, of, that basically the way the business model for Zumba works is you pay a licensing fee to be a Zumba instructor. And then Zumba makes DVDs apparel, there's all different types of Zumba, there's Zumba Gold for seniors, there's Aqua Zumba, and one of the challenges for doing PR for Zumba isn't getting the story out there. If you can't get PR for something that has cultural relevance, then you're not a very good PR person. It's about telling the right story. It's about telling a story that aligns with the brand messaging. So part of the focus for Zumba is the, how they judge their PR efforts is the quality of coverage. Is it presenting Zumba not as a trend, but looking at all of the full aspects of Zumba, making sure that every segment includes three key messages, making sure whether it's promoting the apparel, 
promoting the DVDs, promoting the video games, whatever the focus is at a given time. So I have a video to show, but I don't think there's time. If you, if you want to see it later, I'll be glad to email it to you. But the idea of the video is it shows how there's different types of media coverage for all different facets of Zumba's business. Um, the other, did I get that right? The other, uh, okay, the other case study that I want to point to was Jimmy Dean. So for, was Jimmy Dean, very different brand. Um, for Jimmy Dean, if you're familiar with Jimmy Dean, um, sausage brand, familiar with the country singer. The, what Jimmy Dean had to do around 2005 is the man, Jimmy Dean, was, uh, was you know, he wasn't out in the public eye anymore. He wound up, you know, they, he, he passed away a few years after 2005, but at that point, they realized that they not, need to start to create a brand that, that paid honor to the legacy and to the man, but also wasn't reliant on the man. Additionally, with, with, uh, with Jimmy Dean, it was a top sausage brand. They wanted to become a top breakfast brand. So the Jimmy Dean approach, which has been, which was very effective because it really created a new category in the breakfast space, the frozen protein breakfast category, was they took their ad agency, Shia Day, they took the PR team, they took their media buying team, they took their shopper marketing team, all the different marketing levers, and they had them work in tandem to create a campaign that was fully integrated. So when their <coughs> campaign launched that you may have seen, which centered around a character of the sun, that now is a very long running campaign that's been around for eight years, um, or maybe seven and a half years. They launched it with that movie cinema type approach where you had the advertising hitting, you had the media, um, you had the shopper marketing hitting where you went to the supermarket, you saw the end caps, you saw all the displays, you had PR stories about Jimmy Dean extending into the breakfast category in business press. In consumer press, you saw the product starting to show up. You saw the sun showing up in the news. Um, we had the sun showing up at blogger events and interacting with bloggers. And years later, what wound up happening is two very different brands. Zumba was just named Inc.'s Company of the Year for their approach. And the marketing, of course, was part of it, but helped them advance to that goal. Jimmy Dean was named one of Forbes' <coughs> comeback brands. So two different brands, very different approach, but both of them had, were very effective in taking PR and aligning it against a larger overarching business strategy and bringing PR within the fold. So what I like to do, and this is something, again, that I give to PR people, but I think it's important because I think that if you're managing PR people, call them on this. And you could blame me. So I heard this PR guy talk. And he said these are the seven deadly sins. Some of this we already spoke to, and hopefully most of we spoke to. But thinking like a journalist and not a marketer. In this day and age, to effectively work as a PR practitioner, you have to be able to think in both ways and be able to bridge that divide. Suffering from an inferiority complex. All those years of you know, the baggage that comes with PR being perceived as not bringing value, not being measurable. PR people. At PR as a discipline sometimes has a tendency to have this red-headed stepchild view. But at this point, in order to work effectively, you have to go to the table, one, not, uh, one, not thinking immediately that you're here, that you can't provide value, but being able to show that you can measure results, that you can play a vital role in business strategy, and, uh, and understanding that it's part of a larger team, one team approach is always the best, the best practice. Getting a cheap thrill from deadline pressure. That's something that, that I think that, as, that just within our profession, as PR people, we, we have major issues with. And part of it was that with PR people, sometimes we've been given a plan and say, hey, do something with this, and I have to turn it around. But if you're doing a truly integrated model where you are planning in advance, and you have to have your PR in alignment with media buying schedules and with ad flights and, and with advertising campaigns, you cannot afford to activate in that manner. And also, if you're managing PR people, you can't afford to, to, to have them be sitting uh, on the sidelines. You should be planning early and thinking things out well in advance. And knowing that, you know, with the caveat that you don't want to plan too far in advance, that, it's, that, that the campaign that you're talking about is, is irrelevant by the time it hits, planning out just far enough in advance that everything's synchronized and working in, synchronized and working in lopstep. While at the same time giving yourself enough, enough flexibility, they've got some nimbleness to capitalize on trends, whether it's like, you know, for example, Pinterest came really rose in relevance so high, being able to have a little bit of a contingency so that whether it's your PR or advertising or marketing dollars, being able to put something where you can capitalize on some of these emerging trends or at least test the waters. 
chase, which goes back to chasing, which actually leads to my next one, chasing shiny objects. And this is something that I think, not just PR people, I think all disciplines, something comes out and it's so exciting and so new and you want to jump on it. But for every Twitter, for every Facebook, for every Pinterest, there's a second life or a MySpace. So being able to, to test, test, test and make smart decisions. And for marketers, you know, testing analytics is something that comes second nature. For PR people, it's making sure that they have that same mind mindset and as a PR person thinking like that. Hatred of math I spoke on, unacceptable. Failure to measure, unacceptable. Fear to admit failure. Again, have to be able to admit failure but never accept it. So that's some of my thoughts on uh, PR. I was uh, knowing that there's people in here who cross multiple disciplines. Hopefully, whether you work in PR or whether you work in other disciplines and you work with PR, or if you're educators or students teaching or learning about PR, this is helpful. But now I'd like to open the floor for questions. If there are any. Uh, yeah. Yes. What are some suggestions, or how would you suggest, or how would you talk more about a PR person thinking more as a marketer, and how can the marketer start thinking more as a PR person or a journalist? Absolutely. Think about what is the story of your product, and why should it be told now? So if you're, look at, think about the way a news story is constructed. If you, you're watching the news, it starts off, Jane Doe, this is what, she, you know, you, you, oftentimes reporters humanize stories. Because as people, we don't like reading about brands, we like reading about other people. So it starts off talking about someone, whether it's a news story, whether it's a print story. And it talks about a person, it talks about their lifestyle. It's like, that's why Jane uses this service. That's why she orders from this online grocer. That's why she uses, you know, that's why she bought this product for her kid. Then it goes back and talks about the product. Then it ends with Jane Doe. That's how a lot of stories are written. So part of what you want to think about is, how can you humanize your story? Why should it be told now? And if it's a brand message, how can you put the brand message in the story without making it, getting the promotional message in, but knowing that you're gonna have to make that trade off, that, you're all, that it can't be completely promotional. It has to also be giving value to the reporter so that the readers are learning something. So oftentimes what you'll see is a lot of brands, even restaurants, where you'll, you'll see chefs on TV shows showing how to cook their dishes. So you think about that. If you're a chef, why are you on a morning show saying how to cook a dish? Are you losing business because they're not going to go in your restaurant? The reason why is because if you're that morning show and you know that a celebrity chef is going to go on, people are going to watch past the break because they want to see that chef. They feel like they're getting value out of it. And at the end of the day, the audience knows that they can't cook as good as Bobby Filet. But knowing some of his secrets helps. And ultimately, they may be more predisposed to go to a Bobby Flay restaurant or to go to even a Buffalo Wild Wings. So part of it is knowing that you may have to, that it may not always, it may not be as overt as come into our store. It could be you're on there giving a little bit of knowledge, sharing a little bit of tips, and then saying, hey, even if you don't want, even if, you know, let's say that like that's how you make our steak. But we can make it real easy for you. Just come by our store and sit down. We'll make it for you. And getting that message in at the end. And also, what we typically tell people when they're doing a broadcast interview is that you're going to have one or two key messages that you're going to be able to deliver. Know what those two messages are. Because in a three, or three to five minute interview, it's going to go by so fast. So being able to boil down your story to those messages, and then during the interview, effectively weaving it in, which is a lot harder than it sounds. So. So for example, you think about um, when you see, I mean, this, this is an example that we typically use is you think about politicians. They're asked a question. Sometimes, I mean, the good ones find a way to kind of answer the question, but at the same time, say what they want to say. And say, that's a very good point, but the real story is this. And then they acknowledge the point. The, the, the interviewer is obligated to say, well, what's the real story? And then you say, well, we're offering this product. This is available in stores now. Or, you know, well, thank you for pointing it. That's how I feel about this, but let me tell you about this. So it's bridging a question to another one. That's how you do it during a broadcast interview. During a print interview, what you really need to be working on is your PR person should be, should be negotiating with the journalist to say, you're going to include these messages, and in return, we're going to give you this. 
So part of it also is timing. So for example, the cruise story that I showed before, that story makes sense now because people are going on vacations. Telling that story during a time when people, like what, during a time of year when people are not, like telling it at the height of Halloween season, press aren't gonna cover it because everyone's reporting on Halloween. So part of it is from a seasonal perspective, does it make sense to tell that story now? and understanding how to work within the calendar. And one of the challenges is finding the convergence of where your marketing calendar aligns with the editorial calendar. Because your brand may know that back to school season, that's when we need to get coverage. And figuring out from an editorial standpoint, how does, why does our story work now? So for example, um, with, uh, with, with Jimmy Dean, back to school season is time where people are going to the grocery store and stocking up. So what we were doing was, we, we, uh, for that specific campaign, we were giving tips for moms on how to get ready during busy mornings and how to maximize the day. So we had lifestyle experts saying, here's 10 ways to have an effective morning. Um, and one of it was having a quick protein breakfast on the go. So we promoted, you know, maybe, maybe not 10, maybe like four other messages and one of them was Jimmy Dean. But we got that coverage. So at times, you have to realize that, that you're not gonna have the story about you all the time. Sometimes it will be. Sometimes you're going to have to deliver values in other way to get your message across. So that's a long answer to a short question. I hope that's helpful, though. OK. Other? Thank you. Thank you. I'm so glad to hear that. Yeah, for uh, APR, that last point, that's the accreditation process for if you work in PR, that's basically uh, kind of our, our equivalent of the Series 7, which people, that may not be the best analogy, but basically it's about grounding yourself in, in uh, PR and understanding the, the uh, really the educational roots the uh, executional roots and a lot of the theories and, and ethical practices behind it. So it's, it's a very rewarding process to go through. As far as, the, as, far as um, managing internal clients, the reality is that's tough. And a lot of what I said, you know, easier said than done, you know? But I think that part of it is, there's many different ways. I think one is um, pointing to other brands that do it well. And, uh, and showing this is, and, and, and pointing to case studies. This is something where PR was built in very early and where PR was interwoven seamlessly. And look at the results that they have. And using that to try to um, affect a culture change. Part of it is the art of diplomacy. Spending time talking to wh whoever the decision makers are and, 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 and really working to affect that internal culture change where they understand that, it's, that this is a meeting that PR should be in that there is value in us being here. And it may be, it even I think to the point you raised, sometimes it's the PR implications of what you do. So part of it is whether or not you're, of course, trying to leverage PR to sell a product or market a product. Part of it is if you are enacting a new corporate policy, what the ramifications are of that policy. So I think that a lot of it is pointing to other, I mean, sometimes, I mean, part of what gets people's attention are crises showing, you know, educate, uh, communicating information about some of the different brands and some of the different cautionary tales. And that's, and that's how to get in, uh, make people think about issues and crises and about the need for a crisis <coughs> plan or a social media policy, or, and also actually enforcing and policing it. Um, as far as the integrated marketing, I think part of it is, is uh, going to the decision maker and lobbying for your case. And sometimes it takes time, and you really need to find someone who can be an internal ambassador who could help lobby for your cause. Thank you. Yes. 
はい。Sure. Well, that, that's such an important point. And just as we said that the best approaches when it comes to marketing are integrated, when it comes to crisis management, integration is also best practice. And I think that starts where, in advance, having, having an infrastructure put in place via a crisis plan and a social media plan, where it's understood that, I mean, it really shouldn't be PR owning it or HR owning it or legal owning it. They should all be working together. And part of that comes down to, under, to clarifying what the roles are. Because what legal will typically look at is they'll look at the legal application that wants to say as little as possible. Because rightfully so, they're looking to prevent a lawsuit. For PR, we're thinking about the court of public opinion. And thinking, well, you can't say nothing. Because then there's gonna, it's going to fill that information back. You, the press, bloggers, other people will tell your story. And you may not like what they're saying. And then HR, of course, is thinking about all the HR implications. So what a best practice that I recommend is part of the crisis plan isn't just how to react when a crisis happens, it's clarifying very clearly what the roles are and then making it understood that it's going to require work and, and some trade-offs between HR, PR, and legal. And then once you, I think once, I mean unfortunately you've gone through a couple crises for the, everyone starts to understand and, and you start to have a little bit more, uh, at least ideally, uh, a little bit of an understanding of how to work together. And also part of it too is there's certain crises that you can predict, others that you can't. So if you work, for example, with consumer packaged goods, you know, a foreign object in your product, a recall, um, uh, something with, uh, with a, a consumer having a bad experience, there's certain, there's certain, for those, map out a lot of those crises that you can predict in advance and identify them, identify what the reactive statement is, and and also have it ready and approved by legal. So that way, if you have your team that's actively monitoring, on, actively listening on Twitter or on Facebook, or you know the 4.30 p.m. calls in on Friday, and you know all the key people are out fly fishing or totally unreachable or some other disaster, you have those messages approved, and you're that much closer to, one, saving a lot of time and getting approval, and two, being able to react lightning fast to uh, addressing mitigating and containing crises. So I hope that that answered the question. Okay. Other questions? Okay, well thank you so much for your time. I hope that was that was helpful. Thank you.